Hello and welcome to the third episode of the Harvard Extension School Psychology Student Society podcast. I'm your host, Kimia Grigoria, and I'm thrilled to introduce our distinguished guest, Albion Bowers, and help commemorate National Aviation Day, which is celebrated on August 19th in the United States. With a remarkable 37-year legacy at NASA, including his significant role as chief scientist at the Neil Armstrong Flight Research Center, Albion Bowers stands as a true luminary in aerospace science. His indelible impact on aerodynamics, flight mechanics, and advanced control has reshaped the field. Even in his recent retirement, he remains an inspirational figure, continuing to contribute to research and education. Join us as we embark on a journey through the life of this exceptional scientist and delve into the vital concept of fostering a learning environment that embraces mistakes as opportunities for growth. Welcome, Al. It's so good to have you with us today, and it's been a pleasure and honor to know you through the years. But before we get started, would you mind introducing yourself a little for our listeners? So one of the things I, years and years ago, when I used to do this, I, I never talked about this part of it. There was, but someone stood up and, and very pointedly said, you need to think about where the kids you're talking to are at. And it was like, oh yeah. Uh, because, um, so I was not born in the United States. I was, I was born in Japan. And um, my mom is Japanese. My my dad was in the military. And so he was always away from home. So the language we spoke in the house was Japanese. And um, I came to the United States when I was very little. And um, dad was still in the military. So uh, again, the, the language that we spoke in the house was Japanese. And so the very first day that I actually have to speak English is kindergarten. And I don't have the ability to speak English and certainly not very well. I was in remedial English until I was in the fifth grade, trying to get me caught back up. And um, the, the sad thing was during this whole sort of process was I lost the Japanese and now I'm a, a English only speaker, which really isn't very good. So one of the things I, when I talk to kids, I, I emphasize that some of you live in households that you, you are bilingual and that's truly an amazing thing. And the, the thing that you should remember about that is that you have the ability to communicate ideas and concepts in two different languages to two different cultures. That is so cool that you can do that. And you should cultivate that and be proud of that because there's a lot of us that can't do that. And, and that's, that's super cool that, that you have that ability and, and that's important. The thing I also wanted to emphasize to them was, you know, I, I was born in this little tiny fishing village on the other side of the world. And, uh, population of this fishing village was about 30 people. And um, and I came to the United States and I ended up becoming one of the chief scientists at NASA. That's that's a story that doesn't just happen. That's that's a, I'm potentially the only one that's ever done something like that in in NASA, which is pretty unusual just by itself. But the important point here is that some of these kids have that potential within them as well. And I wanted them to think about that. And that's why I talk about this part of the story. So um, we, we were living overseas again when I, when I got out of high school. I, it, it wasn't a graduation. It, in, in Australia, they call it matriculation. And I was the the first American boy to ever matriculate in, in the Australian school system. I was the, the third American to ever matriculate um, in, in Australia. And after I finished the matriculation, I, I finished up there and I came back to the United States to go to university. And I went to Cal Poly over in San Luis Obispo. It, it's a California thing. And, and I've always come back to California 
um, because of the just the mindset that people have here. There's a uh, it's much more open and it's much less structured, and that's cultivated a certain characteristic in 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 my life that has allowed me to um, it, it it's it's played out in other ways. And some of that hopefully we'll we'll talk about here. So I, I got out of Cal Poly and and uh, one of the things I, I did there was uh, they had a program where they were um, helping to cultivate internships with NASA. And so, hey, sign me up. You know, I, I, I was a NASA kid. I, I watched all those space missions and that was just so amazing. Um, I remember being as a, a, a young kid watching the, the, the landing on the moon the very first time and Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. And um, yeah, super cool. How did you start flying? How did that happen? When I was really young, I remember um, being super fascinated with airplanes, particularly airplanes and, and spacecraft were really cool too. But I mean, airplanes were just I, I I really gravitated towards the 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 aircraft thing, and um, so Dad and I built some model airplanes, and uh, I remember that he showed me how to build the the flying model airplanes, and so I started building those kits as well, and um, I was about twelve years old, and I had you know, gotten up to the point where I had enough money to buy there. You could buy radio control kits so that you could fly these radio control airplanes. And um, so I, I was kind of saving up money for one of those, but there was this new sport in Southern California at that time called hang gliding. And, and you could fly yourself instead of just having your, your model airplane go fly. And so it's like, that's cool. And, and so, um, the the I, I was 12 years old when we started building my my hang glider, and um, I I had just turned 13 at, at my first flight, and that was 50 years ago this year actually um, that I that I did that. So, yeah, I I've had people ask me, you know, you know what what were you thinking about, you know what when you were flying hang gliders. Maybe a better question is, you know, what was my dad thinking? Keep throwing this kid off this cliff and he keeps coming back. That is so cool. I'm, I'm really glad that it worked out because see where you are now and the cool projects that you've done. Um, how did you, how did that lead to getting you to NASA? Uh, so um, I, I think of that, 12 years or so of, of uh, living in Redondo Beach was, was where I think of it ha as having grown up. Um, I spent three years in Australia in the high school system down there. And um, I couldn't uh, fly hang gliders in Australia. I was too young. Um, they, they actually had rules about that in Australia. But they didn't, uh, you, you could be younger than that and actually go out and learn to fly gliders. And so I did that while I was there. And so I flew uh, sailplanes and um, also incredibly cool and much closer to regular normal sort of flying. There was a lot of crossover in that at that point. And um, so uh, I came back to the United States to go to university. I went to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and I got my bachelor's degree there, and I was getting close to the end of my 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 bachelor's degree. And NASA had started up a program where they were cultivating internships for graduate students. And it's like, okay, so I applied for grad school and um, made that. And uh, so um, we ended up. Uh, I ended up doing my my internship with NASA at Edwards Air Force Base. The place was called Dryden then. It was the Flight Research Center for NASA. And they are the 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 and and we use the word research, not it's not a flight test group. It's a flight research group. 
And there's a sort of a fundamental difference between the, the research and the test. The Air Force does, they call themselves the Flight Test Center. And uh, we call ourselves the, the Flight Research Center at, over on the NASA side. And there's a very fundamental difference. The, and it's, it's, it's the way you think about the problem. The Air Force has a particular airplane and they wanna know how that airplane behaves. And if the pilots get themselves into trouble, what can they do in order to get themselves out of trouble? And so it's an operational sort of a, a mindset. On the other side, you have the NASA people, which was us, and we're trying to figure out, okay, so the airplane does something that's not good. We wanna know why it does that and understand that problem better so that we can either design that out or maybe design a way for, for the pilots to be able to react better to it. So there's this very fundamental difference between the way we, we think about the problem. And that, that's come up a, a number of times in dealing with the Air Force. Um, we would do something with the Air Force and they would come down and, you know, they'd see what we're doing. And we're not interested in trying to get the airplane to fly a lot. We want the airplane to fly and understand what's going on. And so there's this very fundamental difference between the, the two philosophies. Uh, we, we've butted heads, you know, with between their guys and our guys and because they're interested in things like flight rate and we're, we're not, you know, we're trying to figure out what's the experiment, what's it trying to tell us. Very interesting, thanks for sharing. So once you got to NASA, I know you've worked on a lot of cool projects, and especially since this is also for Aviation Day. I don't know if you wanna share some of the projects you've worked on. Some of the aircraft that I got to work on was the oblique wing. Um, the, the, it turns out that um, you, for high speed flight, we normally sweep the wings back on aircraft. Well, it turns out that if you sweep the wing forward, it does the same thing. And so um, instead of having two pivots so that you can sweep the wings back, um, you could have just one pivot and the whole wing would sweep and one wing would sweep forward, the other wing would sweep back. And there would be one carry through on that wing, one wing. And it, it's easier to make that much stronger and, and it works better uh, from a mechanical standpoint, but it makes the airplane asymmetric. And so there's a, in, in the mathematics for it, it's really kind of cool. You, you end up with this asymmetric airplane and there's all these cross products, we call them. And th these cross products mean that um, when you try and roll the airplane, you have one, you're creating more lift in one wing and less lift in the other wing, but they're also display, displaced fore and aft. So as you create more lift, it's also not only is the airplane rolling in one direction, but you're, you're lifting the nose up at the same time. And so you have the, these cross products and they come out in the math as well, as well as physical reality. And so there, it, you, you have this really cool thing. And so I, I worked oblique wing for a while. I worked some wind tunnel tests. We never got to build that airplane. Um, we got to crash an airliner. I worked on that. Um, and a full-size airliner, and we were testing a bunch of different things. Um, the major test was for uh, a fuel that wasn't supposed to explode on during the, during the crash, and that's exactly the thing that didn't happen. It didn't work. So the, the fuel exploded, and the fire burned, and um, it's quite spectacular. And, um, but the, the important thing to me, one of the things we learned was the the, the seats were too rigid. And so we had instrumentation that showed how um, the seats would survive, but the passengers that were um, belted into those seats would not. That the, the seats were so strong that they were transmitting all the load of the crash into the person. And so what you actually wanted was a seat that would, we, we use the words in engineering, to fail gracefully. And so the seat absorbs the energy and not the person. And so seats today are meant to actually bend and break. And that is um, actually a good thing because the energy is going into the seat and not into the person. 
So you may end up, uh, if this ever happens to you, you're going to find yourself sitting on the floor after the, the accident. You can unbuckle your belt and get up and run out of the airplane. And that's something that would not have happened in the old style seats. And, and that was something that we had worked on. So th there were a lot of really cool things came out of that. I worked on thrust vectoring for the F F-18. We, we built a thrust vectoring system, put it on an F-18. And that's the way you control rockets. But they're, the blending between the conventional aerodynamic controls to control the airplane and the thrust vectoring, that was an interesting problem because you you how do you blend those? And um, it turned into, there were a bunch of different ideas about how you could control the aircraft. And it turns out that those ideas turned into things that are still in use in, in the current level, like F-35. F-35 uses, it's called dynamic inversion. We were the very first ones to fly dynamic inversion on that F-18. And so um, it, it eventually became a thing. So now that F-35 has that. And that's eventually going to trickle down into airliners and a bunch of other different places. Um, so that's kind of a really cool concept, something that we had worked on um, 30 years ago, which is, which is you, you stop and think, you know, 30 years ago. I mean, that doesn't seem like a lot to me, but I say 30 years, that sounds like a lot. And uh, I worked on the SR-71s. I worked on some, some spacecraft stuff. Um, it, it was really an amazing career. Uh, 37 years with NASA. I loved it. That's incredible. And I know that from my last visit to NASA, everyone still remembers you. And it's just <laughs> because of the work you've done and continue doing. I know you're still very involved. Um, can you share some of the cool projects that you work on now, including teaching and talking to kids? Um, the, the, the places I still have, like my fingers in the pie, um, there's a group that uh, selects um, science experiments that go up to the International Space Station. And I'm on the selection group um, for, we, we go through all the proposals and then we kind of score them and figure out which ones. And then we go back to the, the group that the, the schools and say, th these are the experiments that we recommend that you go fly. And sometimes they agree with us and sometimes there's something else that they have going on and they, you know, we, we aren't aware of. And, and so um, it, it's, it's actually pretty cool. Um, what what these kids are putting together and, and flying their experiments on International Space Station. I'm trying to get them to the point because of the the school cycle being so short, it's it's hard for the students to stick it out all the way to the end and then write the report. And this is the part I'm really trying to you know write the paper at the end and go make a presentation about it. And, and there are places for them to to go do those kinds of things. And I, I, I want to see these kids get credit for, for having done something like that. Because you, you stop and think about, you know, high school kids having their names on a scientific paper. That's, that's not something that normally happens. I, I remember I was, I was 24 when I got my first paper published. And it was like, you know, I had a hard copy and there was like, my name's on this thing, you know, that, that was really cool. That's incredible. If this is something that um, could be possible, I think it's also life-changing for many of the students. And oh, yeah. uh, it's, I really appreciate that you support these things <clears throat> and kind of try to make them happen. Um, even for, I know our interns at PV Nets, you really help them, um, just, I think you opened a whole new world to some of them. And uh, every time we do a tour at NASA, I think it really changes people. And they're, they're like, this is my passion. I want to do this. You know, it gives them an idea early on of like what they want to do. And also the other thing that I noticed at NASA, I think it's the environment and the people, like being in different um, environments, different types of offices, the people 
at NASA are very much like you, very open to ideas, very, very open to speaking about them, finding new solutions, working together. And I don't think, unfortunately, that's something you see everywhere, but that's been my experience from NASA. And I think it's also like your legacy too, like your interns have carried out what you have taught them, how you taught them mm. to be curious and open-minded. Um, have you noticed the difference in NASA and the environment in NASA and other places? Um, yes and no. Um, there, NASA, when I when I got there, had some old school sort of thinking, um, and um, I tried to change that a little bit. In that, um, how do you cultivate an environment where people are willing to stand up and try things and maybe be wrong right and and so you you make you make errors and you go well that didn't work and why didn't that work and are there ways we can fix that and go back and try again and maybe succeed then and so um if if people can learn to do that they they the things that you can learn by doing it that way are far in excess of what you could do like the traditional method. And um, I, I, I tried to emphasize that to my students and we would have conversations um, and I would try and, you know, they're at the very beginning of their, their lives, um, their careers. And so they didn't have the background to know whether you know, this is normal, or is this a good thing? Or, and it was like, you, you know, you, you're not going to get in trouble for making mistakes. Um, I would prefer that if you're going to make mistakes, make new original mistakes, don't make, you know, the same mistake over and over again. But um, uh, that having a safe place to do that and that we all learn that that was where what I, I I really wanted to emphasize with them, and um, we had our share of failures along the way. But it 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 was really cool the what those kids did. I I was I was impressed, and and uh, you know we sometimes. I would get it wrong and we'd stand, I'd stand up and I'd say, this is what we're going to do. And we'd run off and do that. It's like, that didn't work. <laughs> Let's talk about this. I think that's a really <clears throat> helpful way of teaching and hands on and also being open-minded and letting people learning from their mistakes and coming up with new ideas to fix the problems. Um, and one of the things, because I think I got to kind of know you around the time you were working on the Prandle. So I, mm -hmm. I saw the interns working on that. How was the evolution of the Prandle and everything that like from the um, curious, curiosity side of it, the failures, the things that work, like dealing with um, the changes that needed to happen to make it work. How was that process? Um, Prandle was, was very different than anything else um, NASA had done. Um, there, there was a, there was no um, external support um, for Prandle outside of like the small core group of people that were, were at at uh, used to be Dryden. Now we call the place Armstrong, and um, after Neil Armstrong because he was he was a test pilot there, and um, but the the. It was never officially funded by uh, NASA headquarters. They they really weren't interested in it. Actually, they're still not interested in it. But uh, um, I was convinced it was the right thing, and and um, and I convinced a, a handful of other people that it it really was something that was um, could change the way we think about airplanes and aircraft. And that it will, in the long term, be proven that most aircraft should be made that way. And so um, that was what the, the, we tried to design the experiment so that we could show that this is actually a better way to do things. 
And um, I remember explaining to the director and he didn't quite get a really, really good guy. Don't get me wrong. Um, he, his, his career and my career were very much parallel paths. My first day as an intern was his first day as a permanent employee. And, and so we were going through orientation together um, at, at that point. I, I remember that. And, um, but uh, he, he became the director at our place. And so he had to put up with me. And I, I said, I want to put this experiment together and I want to get the results published because I'm convinced that this is going to work. And he was like, you know, can you, he had difficulty even just grasping the, the problem. And so I, I had to figure out how to explain it to people so that they would understand it. And ultimately he, he did get it. And I, I said, we can prove that the traditional approach is actually not the right one for aircraft. And, and I wanna be able to try this new one and show how it works and publish those results. And we actually did that. That was, that was the, the, the big deal. And when I got that first one done, it was like, okay, we've shown how it works. We've shown that it does work, okay? But now it's, okay, so how does it work? And so there's these pieces uh, that are sort of part of the mechanism. And so um, I, we did it again. There was another sort of a, a second project at, at the end. And that one eventually succeeded. That was uh, 2018 when that, that piece, it, it was five years, by the way, from the, from the end of the first one in 2013. And that's the report that got published in 2016. But it was 2013 was the year that we had the data and, and we knew that it, it worked. And so, we went from that to the second one. And the second one was, how does it work? And there's this, you have this, this theory that comes out of um, the mathematics. And that was a paper that was published in 1933. And so we had this theory and there were like big holes in, in the, the theory. It just said, here's what, how the math works. And there were things that the math was telling us and there was no explanation in the original paper. And so it, it was all the way at the very end and, and I'm trying to figure it out and it just doesn't make any sense because the, it turns out that the language that had been used to put the, the work together with conventional traditional aircraft hadn't been developed enough. And so we had to invent new things in order to be able to fully describe what was happening. And so when I start describing this stuff to people, they it's easy for them in retrospect at the end to look at it and they say, oh, okay, now I get it. But the the steps to get there, it's 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 difficult. And so it's how well you can describe this so that people understand it. And that was the that was the piece that we were working on. That's really awesome. And I was gonna ask you, because I'm sure you've had challenges with things not working out sometimes, but how long do you stay with a problem? How long do you try or like is there a point where you're like, okay, it's not worth the time, it's not worth the effort, let's move on to something else. How long do you recommend for people to kind of work on things based on your experiences? Um, some problems are, are fairly small, you know, and, and they're gonna provide some information about, you know, a, a fairly small part of the puzzle. Um, this, this particular one was huge. I mean, like I said, the, the probably 80% of the aircraft in the world should be done this way. And none of them are right now. And so um, we're, we, we were convinced, well, I was convinced early on and, and I eventually got other people to realize it, um, that 
we were going to change the world with with what we came up with and that this is something that absolutely needed to be done and so um it it was like the last decade in of of my career i devoted almost 100% well over more over that because i was thinking about it at home and in the middle of the night and um there were things that we fundamentally had misperceived the way we were putting aircraft together and the and it was so clear when i i started dissecting all of it and that the language was not there in order to be able to describe it. And so we had to start creating uh, a way to describe this. And we added things that um, people were not used to, to looking at. Um, aircraft, traditionally, the way that they're normally put together, there's this concept of um, upwash and downwash that comes off the wing. And so as the wing comes towards, flies through the air, okay, there's this, the, the air is at rest. And as the wing starts approaching the air, the air can sense the, the presence of the wing because of the pressure that's around the wing. And so the, the air actually comes up and meets the wing. And we call this upwash on the, on the, on the front edge. Well, the thing was the, the way this works on, on the, the traditional airplane is the upwash is the same everywhere. It's designed to be that way. And it's designed so that the downwash at the trailing edge is the same everywhere. And so you have this, effectively what it is, is to, it's a two-dimensional solution that's being propagated over the whole wing. And this is the this is exactly what's described in the textbook. The fascinating thing is, you know, this is like asking the fish how it perceives the water that it's in, right? And and it's not aware of the water because it's just there. And so um, that's exactly what we were looking at with the the wing that we had the way the traditional method because it was the same everywhere they used one word to describe the whole thing well the first thing we did was we come in and we have what we call a fully developed three dimensional solution and what what happens is it turns out that the upwash is different at different points across the wing so you can no longer just say well the upwash because it's different everywhere you have to describe it as this is the local upwash. And now you have to integrate, that's a mathematical word for average, or, or you measure the area of the thing. And so you have to look at the effect of the upwash everywhere across the wing, and it's different at different points. And so you put it all together and you come up with the answer of this is the average over the whole wing. And that's sort of the number that everybody was looking at in the traditional answer, but it was that same number everywhere because it was a, a two-dimensional. Ours is a 3D solution. And the downwash on the trailing edge is also a fully developed three-dimensional solution. And this is really hard for people to get. Um, I, I would have arguments with the other aerodynamicists that were at NASA, where I worked. They were in my same group. And I mean, they had watched me struggle through this. And there were a lot of them that just couldn't wrap their minds around the problem. They're still thinking too much in terms of the, you know, they had this traditional way of doing it. And it, set, it, it addles your thinking. You can't you know, you can't let go of that, this thing that you know. And so you keep trying to, you know, square, square pig in the round hole and you're getting a bigger hammer so you can slam that thing in there. And it, it's like, no, you need to let go of it because it's no longer the, the square, it's no longer the round hole. It's, it's a square hole and you've got a square peg and you've got to fit those together and make this work. 
And that that was too hard for some people to. And and this is when I go talk to other aerodynamicists, this is the biggest problem. They they have difficulty in letting go of that traditional way of thinking. Very cool. Yeah. So when working with interns, working with students, do you have any methods to help them kind of let go if they're stuck or come up with new ideas? Are there any like specific methods that you use? Um, so first off, young people are much more, their, their minds being young, they, they're still trying to figure out what, what all this is. And you're, you're talking about some pretty esoteric high order stuff. And in general, the students that I got had not been introduced to it or had just been introduced to the traditional way of doing this. And, and I'm the guy that's standing up and saying, you know, the emperor has no clothes. And, uh, the, and, and I say, you need to let go of some of that and let's sit down and talk about this. And there were a bunch of them that just, I mean, they immediately got it. And it was like, and, and they, they really understood it. I mean, to, to a ridiculous degree, they, they were, I, I could get the, I mean, it's something that took me like 17 years to figure out. And, and they, I could get them up, up to speed in 20 or 30 minutes. And they'd start saying, but Mr. Bowers, if that's true, then this other thing works this way. And I go, exactly. You, you, and, and that's when I knew they had it. And, and uh, they'd be off and running and it's like, you know, I, it, that, that's the point. I, I have to step back and get out of their way. And watching them struggle through this and, and eventually we, we together would figure this stuff out. And uh, watching them do that, it, it was so awesome. I loved it. That's very cool. Yeah, they're very lucky that they got a chance to have the opportunity to learn from you and also experience what it's like to have the environment that allows them to explore. Based on some of the stuff that you've done, is there a favorite? Um, a, a favorite? Huh? Uh, a student intern? No, no, um, I mean like projects. <laughs> projects. Uh, of, the, of the projects? Oh, yeah. Crandall is, is without question the 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 one that I, I'm going to remember, be remembered for the most. Because this is this is this is the we the thing that we were trying to disassemble was so fundamental, so um bedrock in, in the in the engineering. Um it and you know, I'm the guy that's standing up there with the sledgehammer trying to tear it down. And that's the one I think we're all gonna get remembered for. When when I by the way, when I when I published both of those papers, um, I made sure every single student's name was in both papers. We had 173 students that were in in the in the whole process. I wanted to make sure their names were in there so that they could, you know, stand up and hold that paper up. See, there's my name. You know, and and that was a. Uh, I have I still you know meet with some of those students and I tell them you know it would not have happened without you, um, and and that's they 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 get that and um, there there's a couple of the the students that I see quite frequently, <laughs> and uh, that's just mind blowing that. You know, we did that together. I think that's really thoughtful. Aside from just giving them credit for something that they have done, which they should get credit, but honestly, not it's not always given um, on projects. Um, it's really thoughtful and it's very helpful for the future of the students. It helps them in their careers. It helps them in their education. And also just the pride of having your name on something you have worked on is incredible. So Thank you for doing that. I think it's really wonderful. In I'm not sure the year, but was it 2017 or 18? I think you guys were working on the um, Prandtl. Was it for the Prandtl for Mars mission? 
Yeah, um, that started in um, 2014 and it became a pretty big thing in 2015. And um, uh, those, we, we figured out that you could, this, this actually worked in a, in a very fundamental sort of a way and that um, we proposed it for, for uh, flying on Mars. The, the difficulty was we didn't have the science experiment that said what you need to do to, to fly on Mars. Well, it turns out that that science experiment has now identified itself. And um, the John Badilski, who is still there at NASA Armstrong, um, has sent a proposal to NASA headquarters that, hey, measuring the magnetic field in the Southern Highlands um, is, is something that's very fundamental that goes to the what's going on on Mars. And what you actually do need is some sort of an aircraft that flies further than a little helicopter. Um, and so uh, you actually need something that can fly thousands of kilometers. And so that's what they're trying to figure out how to do now. And, and uh, um, I, I think Bedelsky is the leader of that group. And man, I, I would love to see that go. That would, that would be an amazing, really amazing thing. And just for our listeners that might not know um, too much about this project, uh, as far as I remember, it's about the atmospheric testing. Is that correct? Yeah, it was. And um, the they're actually trying to measure the magnetic field on Mars. And there's variations in the magnetic field. And there's a certain place where um, they're not sure exactly what the magnetic field looks like in that area, but they do know that it varies and they don't understand why. And so that's what they're, they wanna go invest investigate is to fly over this area and see how the magnetic field varies in that particular area. And uh, um, so it, it, it's, it's related to the volcanism that they had in, on Mars. And it, it would be fascinating to have the answer to that. I know this is a project that a lot of time and effort and energy has gone into it. So I really hope to see it move forward and I will be following up and I hope to see this mission come to life and um, eventually lead to the results that you were hoping for. I think a book is being written. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. The process of witnessing it through somebody else who's not familiar. Can you kind of explain <laughs> that for the listeners? Yeah, this, this is a part of the, the history series and, and it's, it's written to a different level audience as well. Um, the technical papers that we write are generally intended to speak to people who um, have the background uh, in engineering. Um, that, that's the way we write the papers. It's it we're not going to um, handhold people through the mathematics and things. Um, we're we're going to you know big jumps and and. This is what comes out, and this is what comes out. This book is going to, in in a, a way, sort of fill in some of the gaps and tell the story of this this who the people were, and especially the key player that that ended up changing the way that we approach certain problems. That's all going to be in there, talking about the the struggles and the. I went back and I, I talked to one of the professors that I had dealt with long, long ago. He he is a he was uh, he's gone now. He was a very a very famous professor. Gentleman's name was Richard Epler, and I I worked with him very early in my career. And w when I go to Aero uh, groups and I say, yeah, I was one of the students of Richard Epler. There's a oh. You know that that all of a sudden, and th there's a um, and it's. I do that. Not to emphasize how smart I am. That's that's definitely anybody who knows me knows that's not what I I'm, because I I'm I'm not that good 
I'm I'm more of a nuts and bolts sort of a I refer to myself as a knuckle dragger engineer, and that's that's still very true. Um, but when I when I talk about yeah, I actually worked with this guy you know long ago, and that always gets people's attention. There's a certain gravitas that he has that they. Let me give you an example. Um, there's a, a an award that the the Germans give every year, um, and they give out one every year, and um, they've done this uh, every year since 1950, and it's called the Prandtl Ring. And it, so Ludwig Prandtl was this brilliant theoretical, mostly mathematician. He was less of an engineer, but he was very much a physics kind of a guy. And um, he worked at the Max Planck Institute, which was a very famous place. Um, Niels Bohr was there. Einstein would come. Um, they, they, they did things that were uh, astrophysics and incredible, incredible stuff came out of the, the people that worked there. Crandall was one of the professors there, and he worked in fluid mechanics. And the stuff that he was doing in fluid mechanics was just as important, but it wasn't as interesting to people at that time. And so Crandall never got huge recognition during his lifetime. He died in 1953, but many years later, um, they, the, the DLR in Germany decided to give this award and it's, um, it's the highest award that they give and it's got Crandall's name on it. And it's literally a, a, it's a huge ring with this piece of quartz that's on the front with an eagle on the, on the piece of quartz. And, um, and it's it's solid brass. You don't actually wear it, you know. But it's a, it's it's this massive thing, and they they present it in a special presentation box and and everything. Well, my professor Richard Epler got the Prandtl ring in 1978, and I mean that's like that's just huge. I mean it, it's like. You, the the number of professors that have gotten the award, I, I think um, less than half of the people who have gotten the award have been professors. And he was one of the people. And there's this thing that he was doing that is related. Um, the One of the professors that he worked with um, was actually a student of Prandtl's. So you could think of... of of Epler as being sort of one of the grandchildren of Prandtl. Well, that makes me one of the great grandchildren. And so there's this, and the thing was, the these guys, they were, they're so brilliant and they figure this stuff out, but then it's like, it's only half baked and they, they put the idea on the shelf and they're done. And this is what happened to Prandtl with his 1933 paper. Literally, no one did anything with that until I started messing with it in the late 1990s. And my friend Russ Lee, by the way, at um, Air and Space Museum in uh, Washington, D.C., he was the one that actually got me my first copy of, of this Prandtl report and uh, trying to figure out what it meant and I'm, you know, it's only, it's written in German, so it's really difficult for me to understand, and I'm just not that good. And I mean, the Prandtl would describe something, and then he would not, like, fill in the gaps, and I found, I, it took me a long, long time to figure out that he didn't know the answer to those things, and it wasn't that he was covering them up or anything, it's just he wasn't willing to like put himself out there. And so I'm the guy that's trying to like describe this to people. And there's, there's parts of it that I figured it out. And there's other pieces that come in from other people that like, I figured this out. And 
there's like gaps and I'm filling in the gaps in order to make this work and it worked. And that's the stuff that we've published in the papers that, that we put together. That's so cool. So when you say you filled in the gaps, um, how, I, I mean, I know you have a lot of knowledge, but what helped you get there? What, how, how did you fill in the gaps? It's, it's a process with the, your imagination. There's the traditional way of doing things. And you look at those traditional ways of doing things and you go, okay, that doesn't work for this case. So I'm talking about the difference between the way we build airplanes and the way birds fly. And there's a, a very foundational difference. Um, Wingtips are really robust, strong things on airplanes. I mean, people walking out on the wingtips airplanes, that happens all the time. And we know that um, the wingtips on birds, um, this, this is one my wife actually found for me a couple nights ago, and um, I mean, they're, they're just so incredibly soft and, and okay. So you, this could not, um, it, I mean, the amount of load that this could carry, you, you can see it's, it's grams, right? And um, so birds don't do the really super, super strong rigid thing at the wingtip. And so you know what the load is that the, the wingtip can carry at this point. I mean, it's next to nothing. And I describe this to people, the, the curve, by the way, it, Crandall describes this in his, his paper is the curve for this. And it, it comes down and it tapers to nothing, but not only does it just taper, but the, the slope of the curve becomes nothing at the tip, just at the point that it comes to zero. Now, believe it or not, um, everybody does this, okay? Um, you do this. You drive a car and you stop at a stop sign. And as you come rolling up to the stop sign, just as the car is coming to a stop, you don't hold the brake the same. Just as you come to the stop, you let up on the brake pedal so that the car glides to a stop gently. So the load coming down and it levels out just as it gets to the end is the exact same thing. So you're doing this when you come to a stop, when you drive, okay? And so it's the exact same thing on, on the feather of a bird. And, but that's not the way we make airplanes. And airplanes are, it's very strong and the, the load disappears very abruptly at the wingtip. And so there's, it's, it's a very fundamentally different sort of a thing. And this is the piece that, that people are missing actually um, along the way. And doing it that way is really hard for people to imagine that build airplanes because they're used to making the wingtips super strong and rigid and stiff. And everybody says, well, it has to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. And that's the, th this is the part that it's, it's really difficult. And I have to tell you, it took me a long time to grasp this idea. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a very difficult idea for people to, to comprehend. That's very interesting. Um, what do you hope to see for the Prandtl in the future? Oh man, that, I, I mentioned that probably 80% of the world's aircraft um, need to use this idea. Uh, eventually, I think that will happen. I, I'm, I'm convinced of that. Eventually, um, people will get used to this idea. The, when I talk to engineers, um, most of them don't get it. The amazing thing is when I go and talk to biologists, they totally get it. And they're, they're I, I remember this one, one talk that I gave at USC and um, the pterosaur, um, you know, dinosaurs, um, 
pterodactyls and stuff. Uh, their pterosaur expert came over and he was sitting in the audience as I, and as I'm presenting this stuff, I'm describing how, you know, the thin bones at the, the very tip of the, the pterosaur, you think about how much load that can carry, you know, it's, 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 it's not, it's like the tip of the feather. And, and so they've, they've got these long slender bones that have no muscles associated with them. And so how much load can there be on that? And I'm, I'm describing this, this curve that comes down and just it, as it goes to zero, the, the slope goes to zero. And, and th this guy is literally jumping up and down in his seat. He was, he was so excited because what I was saying spoke exactly to the thing that he knew about the animals that he was looking at. And so it's the exact same thing, talking about the, the difference between airplanes and birds. And we just happened to be the ones that figured it out. And like I said, it took me 17 years to let go of that airplane way of, you know, building things. And I described this to my students as, you know, I'd bang my head on the keyboard and, you know, my head would hurt and, and I, I wouldn't get it. And I'd, I'd take the paper and I'd, I had this folder that sat on my desk and I would put the, I had six papers that were in there that were all, all related to this same thing. And I put that paper in there and, you know, like every week I'd take another one out of there and just read it. It's like my head would hurt. And I put that on the bottom of the pile. And then I, next week I'd read a different one. Like I said, 17 years. That, I'm glad you stayed with it because I think it's going to turn into something very cool. And as you were mentioning, I think one of the, I'm a really big fan of multidisciplinary research because I feel like <laughs> attention, I feel like a biologist can add something to um, the, the other fields and you can add something to other fields. And it's because we're so kind of boxed into some certain mentality sometimes that I think when different yeah. disciplines come into play, I think can really give us different views. And it was really interesting. You just mentioned that, that you, you said a biologist. Yeah. Um, and I, I've noticed this when I when I go talk to biologists, they they get this much quicker than the than the engineers do. But at the same time, they're the ones that have been noticing this problem for years and years and years, looking at these these issues associated with this particular this idea of how things fly. And they look at all the airplanes, you know, and and it's it's really super mechanical, and they're going. That's not the way the bird works. And they're right. That's not the way the bird works. And the we can stand up and say, we understand this now. And so we've we've put the things out there. And there, there it was very funny. There was another aero engineer. He figured out something very fundamental in, in uh, 2012 associated with the wandering albatross. And um he said he wanted to figure out why birds are able to do this and fly without vertical tails. And it's like, I, I regret to inform you, we've figured it out. So, yeah. So I know you that you said, I think about 80% of flights you're hoping to see that um, this kind of takes over. Yeah. Can you give us some of the benefits for people that are unfamiliar? How would this benefit? Um, it's less drag. Um, it's it's about um, twelve percent less drag than what we do right now. Um, the the other thing that's that's just if you did everything all exactly the same, um, you would get a, a twelve percent decrease in drag. The other things that go along with this, the ability to get rid of that vertical tail. I mean. I ask this question every time I, I give this give this talk. Um, what's what's the tail on a 737 way? Okay, it turns out that tail weighs about 12,000 pounds. So 12,000 pounds, you could carry 12,000 pounds more payload. You could carry 12,000 pounds more fuel. You could carry uh, 12,000 pounds less and actually decrease the drag of the airplane by by that amount. Um, there, there are benefits that come out that we haven't even 
started to think about or discuss. And um, that's that's the big deal. And when you add all these things up, all of a sudden you start talking numbers like 50% reduction of drag. Um, and, and so because it cascades on itself. And so you end up with this very, very large savings right off the bat. And people aren't thinking about that. And if this works for a wing, it should also work for a propeller or a compressor blade and a jet engine. And so there's other places that this, this idea works. And suddenly you have even more because the propulsive efficiency goes up by the same amount. And so now you have the, the, the two playing it together. And now you're talking numbers like 70% on efficiency improvement. And, and that's, when I say those numbers, people look at me like I'm crazy. And I go through the math and all of a sudden they, they, they realize that the, the benefits are, are huge and we're ignoring that right now. Wow, that's a big difference. Um, is there any way, I'm wondering, can people help to make this happen? Like, what do you recommend if people want to uh, see this happen in the future? They're, they're, the people that you really need to change their minds are the ones that work for the, the major manufacturers. Um, if you can change their minds, then that's when it things take off and it, it really goes. The, the approach right at, at the moment is um, you, there really isn't much that, um, well, okay, I'm, I'm thinking strictly in traditional sort of terms uh, because of the way that we've structured the, the problem. But right at the moment, you, you have to convince someone, you know, at Boeing that this is now, something else you need to sort of understand Boeing invested a lot in the 787. And uh, they farmed out a lot of the pieces to other, other manufacturers. Those manufacturers build their stuff and then that comes back to Boeing. And this was a very different model. So they had to build a whole new assembly line and everything just to build those aircraft. And, and they spent, I think the number is about $22 billion on. And that's the investment that they have to now try and pay back by selling these aircraft, okay? So it becomes an economic thing. Now, they've only worked their way back through about 10 or $12 billion so far. They've still got another 10 or 20 billion sort of number in order to pay all that off and the interest and everything on the loans. So. It's going to be decades until that gets done. And the trouble is because they, at that point, they've paid off the investment, they wanna try and reap the profits on that by continuing on. But if you, you know, some idiot is out there throwing the monkey wrench in the whole thing by changing the whole idea of how you do this, that just messes it up. Right. And so that's that's how everybody looks at me. It's like we can't change the way it is. The 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 cost would be too prohibitive. And so in the meantime, you're continuing to just erode away at the 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 cost savings that could happen if you would go down this road. So it's a it's it's a very difficult problem to try and change. This, I mean, the inertia, you know, it's like the little tiny rudder on the aircraft carrier trying to get the thing to turn. This, this, that's what this is. Sounds like maybe it would be beneficial if a new company starts <laughs> to start. It, it, <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you if you don't have all the infrastructure and everything, then then this becomes that idea. How do you how do you get there from here? Yeah. I hope to see that. That would be very. Cool. And I think um, once it gets going, it's going to get picked up 
when they see the benefits, the changes. But I hope to see a company that takes this over, takes on this project, and um, hopefully you see all your hard work kind of come to fruition. Do you have any recommendations for students, for interns, for people that are interested in this industry that you would want to share with them right now? The students that I had, I, I, I warned them before they would go back to school that, you know, okay, so you, you've been exposed to something that's like so cutting edge, it's not even in the textbooks yet. And, and, and so I was like, you know, you're going to go back and they're going to tell you, no, that's wrong. Don't do it that way. And you're going to have to learn how to do it their way. And that's going to be the answer that they are looking for when you take tests. And, um, and you should definitely regurgitate what they have just said to you. And um, because the important thing is for you to get done, that's going to be a struggle. And there's just nothing you can do about that. That's just the way it is. So I, I wonder about students, you know, that they're, they're going back and telling other students, you know, oh, I did this stuff during the summer and we're doing all this stuff wrong. It's like all, all true. And, and I'm sure there's a bunch of professors out there in the universe right now in aero engineering who just hate my guts because, you know, I, I'm, I'm telling these students that we're doing this wrong. I'm just saying. And, and uh, these students are going back to their professors and saying, you know, Professor Smith, by the way, you know, that doesn't actually work that way. And, and so I, I'm hoping that these professors are open-minded enough to, you know, dust off this old report and look at this old report by Prandtl and think about it. Because um, I, I had one of my friends at NASA, he, he was at a, another NASA center. He's, he's got a doctorate in aero engineering. And uh, he's still 100% the old way. And, and I'm describing this to him. And he says, well, that can't possibly work because we know that this, is, this one is the minimum drag. And I said, that's the minimum drag for a wing of that size. That's not the minimum drag for the wing of this weight. And that's, that's what this Prandtl one is, is it's the... What's the minimum drag out of the amount of weight of structure that you can get? And once you pick that size, that weight of the aircraft, this is that answer. And this is the minimum drag that you can get out of that structure. The, in other words, the, the, re, the reality of the situation is this is the minimum drag. If you did anything else, it will have more drag or be heavier, which is more drag or any, literally this is the bottom of the bowl, okay? And they, they, they can't let go of that, but I can get less drag this way for a wing of that wingspan. It's like, that doesn't matter because you have to change the amount of structure necessary to carry that load then. And so anyway, I, so I'm having this argument with my buddy and I said, there, you know, that's what this one is, that if there's a model in there for the weight of the structure, and I, I get that it's a, we call it a first order, really basic estimate on, on how much the wing weighs. And that's in there. And you're trying to minimize the weight on that or hold that to some value. And then you try and minimize the drag that you get out of that. And, and I said, that's what this one is. He says, well, no one does that. And, and so he, he's basically saying, I'm not going to read your report. I don't care. You're wrong. And it's like, okay. Oh, that's unfortunate. But that's what I mean about I really enjoy that you're so open minded and look into things and try to see it from um, new, pers new perspectives. And well, I really appreciate people like you. I think that's what's going to bring the change that we need in different areas. Is there anything you want to mention? Any um, stories that? that yeah, some. When I talk to students, and we we have the conversation about what's 
what's going on and and you you have this idea of how things are supposed to work and it's it's absolutely true that you have to have someone who believes in the idea and won't let it go to bring it to some usable state but you have to have the found the the fundamentals the foundation in order to understand what's going on before you can have that ability to to work on that there there are a lot of people who believe in things that never do succeed because there was some foundational piece that they didn't have and so that that part of it doesn't work the the ones that you always hear about are the success stories right um, or the unbelievable catastrophic failures. Those are those are the ones that that exist. Um, it's it's really a difficult thing, by the way, when you get the idea to go do something like this. It really is a very difficult thing because it's a lot harder than you'll ever imagine. And it's the amazing thing is it doesn't let go of you. You know, you you can't just stop thinking about it. It it just consumes you. It really does. And this one consumed me. I really appreciate you speaking with us today. I know I took a lot of your time, but I think people are really going to enjoy hearing you talk because you know you, you've had such an incredible career and you continue teaching and continue following up on the projects that you started the trouble you started <laughs> but <laughs> i think i think it's going to bring a great change to you know for the aviation world and it's been incredible knowing you through the years and knowing that you have changed many students interns and now employees lives with what you have done and what you continue to do. It's really inspiring because I know you really care. You really put the time and effort into it. I'm looking forward to having you back for a webinar at HESPSS, Harvard Extension School Psychology Student Society. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you.